The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each week on the show, we discuss talks from the most recent general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and hopefully have a little bit of fun as we study the words of the men and women God has called to direct His Church in these latter days. I'm your host, Matthew Watkins, and I'm joined by a very special guest and ward member of mine, which means we get to record in person, which is nice, Melissa DePale. And Melissa, say hi. Hi. It's good to be here. And we're going to be discussing Elder Holland's most recent talk from the April 2022 General Conference, Fear Not, Believe Only! Exclamation <laughs> Point. Now, Melissa, at the beginning of every podcast, we do like to ask our guests to share a conference experience that you've had in the past, something that has touched your life or impacted kind of the way that you run things or really stuck out to you. Do you have something like that you can share with us? Uh, I do. Um, I am originally a convert to the church. Um, and I recall very specifically uh, my first time being at conference in person. Uh, I was able to go to one of the first sessions in the new uh, conference center that that they have in, in Salt Lake. And I just remember there was a moment when kind of everyone's sitting there and kind of getting ready and then things get quiet and the prophet and the apostles walk out. And for me, that was a moment where I knew that I was in the right place at the right time and that the decision that I had made to join the church was the right decision for my life and just a a, a strong testimony builder for me um, at that time when I, you know, at that time it was President Hinckley. And, uh, and I remember he would often kind of wave his cane <laughs> as a gesture the, the of The cane love. he never used <laughs> medically, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I just, you know, I, I just remember seeing him and just thinking, you know, he is, he's just a person, but at the same time, he's a prophet of God. And I'm, you know, just felt immensely grateful just to be a part of the Lord's church and to be able to listen to him and the other apostles. And so that was kind of an experience I'll never forget. Oh, that's wonderful. I've never been to the conference center in person, but I hear that whenever the prophet and apostles <laughs> walk in, it gets quiet and everyone stands up. It's people get chills. It, that is so true. <laughs> uh, it, it is, um, a, there, for me, it was a very physical response. You know, my, my heart kind of, uh, kind of started to beat a little bit faster and everything just slowed down. And so, absolutely. I think for a lot of us, um, we do feel those chills, you that's know, when awesome. they walk in. And what is a conference talk that's really stuck out to you in the past? What's been like a really defining one for your life? Well, as a mental health professional, uh, one of the talks that I often reference and uh, discuss where appropriately with those that I work with, um, sometimes just in general principles or even sometimes more specifically, if it is um, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ that I'm working with is the talk by uh, Elder Holland. And it is the talk in October 2013 entitled Like a Broken Vessel. That talk, I think for so many people, for so many different reasons, was just so raw and real about um, how a lot of us struggle at some point in our lives with, with, uh, some mental health crisis or issue or, or, um, and it was just, it, it was as if he was sharing a little part of himself as well. And maybe experiences he's had an apostle, but also just extending, um, hope and, and, uh, an invitation for everyone to, um, to understand that these things happen and they're amongst all of us in some way, shape or form. I think a lot of members of the church, when Elder Holland in that talk talked about himself experiencing depression, they were like, whoa, if an apostle can wrestle with this, maybe I can too. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he, I think he mentioned that there was a season in his life where he felt like he experienced some of those uh, emotions or symptoms. And um, I think it was just helpful to normalize that 
we're human and we're, we're here on this earth and there's going to be opposition and there are going to be those things that we struggle with and it doesn't reflect our worth or, you know, our spirituality. Um, like we were kind of talking about before, but, um, but that that's very real and there's no shame in that. Very cool. Yeah. I, I, I love Elder Holland. We're not supposed to have favorite apostles, but <laughs> he might be. He's one of my favorites too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And he, he starts out his talk directing towards the young people of the church, meaning anyone Russell and Nelson's age or younger. When he said that, I thought, you know, there's probably some 97-year-old or 98-year-old out there that's like, oh, <laughs> you know, feel a little left out. <laughs> Hopefully then, not too many people. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Well, the more people, the better. We need that wisdom. And he shared, of course, that wonderful note from Marin Arnold, the little girl. Dear Bishop. General conference was boring. Why do we have to do it? Tell me why. My kids perked up at that. They, for once, they looked at general conference like, I know, this is exactly, yes. It was like it was written for them. But then he quickly switches off of a very light note. Um, and he starts talking about a lot of the struggles that we are going through today. He talks about in Yale how um, they had a class and a full quarter of the entire student body enrolled in it about, you know, mm-hmm. happiness and the good life and just the desperation people have for some semblance of stability and control and finding joy and optimism for the future in our life. Now, where have you seen this experience for? Like I said, it's, it's a real treat for me to do this episode with you because you are a mental health professional in addition to a really awesome young women's president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm doing my best. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, obviously with the onset of COVID, um, just from my small perspective and the people that, um, in my sphere of, of my private practice and where I work, um, definitely have seen an, uh, a huge increase of, of anxiety and depression. And, um, that's very real for so many people because, um, with that, we had to be isolated. And at the core of that, you know, as humans, we are truly wired to connect with other people and you, you take, aspects of that away and we our bodies and our minds we don't like that naturally and so with that came a lot of just increasing numbers of of uh, symptoms Uh, not only just anxiety and depression but i was reading an article uh, the other day that was talking about just a huge percentage increase in eating disorders as well for some of our youth as well so um definitely have seen that seen um just in terms of marriages and families and just the stress that not, not just COVID, but just what our day brings um, and how that's filtered into the families as well and cause just heartache and pain and isolation and um, just a whole host of issues. Um, so definitely, yes, we, you know, as the president Nelson and apostles talk about how we are living in those days um, before the, the savior's, you know, second coming uh, definitely, see so many of those uh, things that the scriptures talk about in the world's in commotion and men's absolutely yeah yeah and no one is immune you know no one is immune um i think we make decisions you know that can affect that but at times there's it can things can just happen and fall into our laps and we have to deal with it yep and elder holland talks about one of his first suggestions for how to deal with it was he brought in this this quote he said Begin your search for happiness by embracing the bounty we have already received. Now, this was really interesting for me studying this talk um, a few weeks ago because I had just recently watched a YouTube video, which I'll link in the show notes, where from a scientific standpoint, they were talking about dissatisfaction Mm -hmm. and how to overcome that. And they went and talked about genetics and all this other stuff. But then they talked about the number one way to overcome dissatisfaction was gratitude. And they specifically talked about keeping a gratitude journal and they, they talked about all these things and it was really fascinating to watch this very scientific aimed video backing up the words of the apostles and prophets that they've been teaching for decades. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was thinking is we've, we've, as members of, of the church of Jesus Christ, we've been told so many times to uh, be mindful um, each day of what we're grateful for and even to write it down. And so many, I think President Irene, he talks about some experiences of keeping a gratitude journal. And so absolutely. I mean, we know that the prophet and the apostles, they speak, you know, the words of God. And so it, it, it for us, you know, it may not surprise us to see that research is backing that up. <laughs> I mean, but you think about it from a worldly standpoint, it seems so counterintuitive. Oh, you feel like you don't have enough? Okay, well... 
change your mind about that. You know, start realizing yeah. how much you have. It, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem that the way you would get more or feel like you have more is to focus on the little that you have. Hmm. But th- that's what Elder Holland says. And the science certainly does back it up. And so I, I, I appreciated that call out for there that I was able to see in, in my own non church studies. Um, what are some other sections that, that you saw around here that really jumped out to you? Well, one of the things that he, he taught, well, if we can just back up for a second, but sure. he talks about, um, like you just said, that we can still focus on the things that we do have. And I just want to just briefly talk a little bit about just happiness in general. Um, in our society, we tend to think that what happiness means is that we are always feeling good. And that's not necessarily what happiness means. Happiness and, and living, a, a, a enriched, quality life is actually us experiencing a whole bunch of emotions on a spectrum. Uh, and sometimes we get caught into that in order to be happy, I'm always supposed to feel good. I'm always supposed to, you know, have those feelings. And, and that's just not really how, how life is. It's a mixture and, and how we find, um, happiness and things that we still can value despite maybe the other emotions that we're feeling as well. So I just, uh, that was just something that stood out to me when I first read that, that part. Um, as you said, working with the youth right now in, in my calling, the next thing that kind of uh, stood out to me was he talked about the youth a little bit and, and how, um, he understands why for some of the youth, um, things are really difficult for them and maybe they're struggling, you know, with own, their own thoughts and testimonies with, all of the commotion that's going on. So that's something that really struck me, him speaking to the youth. I'm going to take both the points you just talked about. When I was a young man, I really struggled with, what would be the right word for this? Feeling bad about how I felt, I guess Mm -hmm. is a good way to say it. Because in the sacrament prayers, we're told that they may always have thy spirit to be with them, right? So the promise is that we can always have the attendant blessings of the Holy Ghost. And I interpreted that to mean I'm always going to feel the Holy Ghost, I'm always going to feel that companionship and feel happy and feel just inspired and in tune and, you know, take the EFY feeling, right? <laughs> take the spiritual highs. I'm supposed to feel like that all the time. Otherwise, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. There's something wrong with me. Yeah. Exactly. And so it took me a long time to learn, oh, wait a minute. There is this natural ebb and flow, even of even of spiritual happiness, even of feeling, you know, that, that buoyant feeling of a spiritual high. That can't last forever. Um I remember in particular, I was watching a talk from President Oaks, and he said, for a variety of reasons, all priesthood holders experience mm-hmm. highs and lows of spiritual receptivity. It's not just about sin. I was like, okay, so that doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong when I just kind of have a bum day in church just isn't quite as fulfilling as sometimes I want it to be. And so it, it, it made me happy to hear something like that as well. A- absolutely. Uh, I think that happens to all of us. And I think as members of the church, we, we want to be as best as we can, do as good as we can, you know, for the most part, our hearts just have the best of intentions. And, but at the same time, it, it's my testimony that Heavenly Father really knows that we're not going to always have those days where we're on a spiritual high and it has nothing to do with what we've done or that we're sinning or, or, or anything like that. It's just, it's a part of the mortal experience that we have here. And I say that with, with definitely all due respect because some days are, are bad. And then we have some days that are really bad, you know, and he, he kind of goes into this, uh, into his talk. We'll probably get to that point, but, um, so I want to make that distinction is yeah, there's, there's bad days and then there's really bad days that maybe mix in with several bad days, months, maybe even years until it becomes a trend. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the, and then like you said, the happiness when the range of emotions all focused in the lower end, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, uh, I, there was a study done and I, I, I don't have the, um, the source with me, but there was a study done that, uh, a whole bunch of researchers have come up with, you know, nine basic human emotions. And, uh, I'd say about at least like half of those from our society's point of view would be labeled as negative, even though they're just part of the regular human experience. Uh, and so, you know, growing up in our society, we tend to think, oh, well, that's a bad emotion and that's a good emotion when really we're supposed to learn and grow from all of those emotions on that spectrum. Think of the movie Inside Out, right? You know, it's got the five characters. Only one of them is joy and the rest of them are all perceived as yes, negative. Yes, right. That's a great example. <laughs> yeah, that's a great example and a really good, uh, just kind of teaching tool. I think even I remember my kids watched that and we, we had that discussion 
of why those characters existed, you know, in that movie. Yeah, and, anger and disgust yes. and sadness and all, they, they, they have their place. Yes. yes. Um, and then, of course, the promise isn't that we're all, when we, when God says we're always going to have a spirit to be with them and that we can always have peace, that doesn't mean that we're always going to feel all happy dappy do. And it also doesn't mean we're not going to have troubles. We think of the family proclamation, right? It doesn't make a promise saying, you know, if you live the gospel, you're yeah. going to have all these blessings. It says happiness in family life is most likely to be achieved. And then Elder Holland sort of adds a little bit of that wording here. Um, at the end of this paragraph, he says, uh, let's see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which holds aloft the mission and message of the Savior world, offers the most eternally significant way to both find good and do good. It's not an unqualified promise that says everything about this is absolutely perfect and don't question anything. It says this is the most eternally significant way. This is the best way that there is to find good and do good at this time. Yeah, you know, it makes me think of uh, over the over the years that I've been working with uh, about half my practice is just people in the community uh, who may have a religious affiliation or not, and then about half are, are members of, of the Church of Jesus Christ, and and. It makes me think of, you know, many times I've worked with so many people where maybe they've done everything they were supposed to do as parents, right? And, you know, they do FHE and they, you know, study the scriptures with their children and yet their children are still choosing different paths in their lives. And, uh, and there is no sure 100%, at least here on earth, right? We know what the, the end plan is. Um, but on here on earth, if even no matter what we do, if we follow everything, um, there's no hundred percent that it's always going to go exactly how we want it to. Yep. And if we base our happiness on whether our children serve missions, whether our children yeah. are married to the temple, we're just guaranteed to be unhappy. Eventually odds are, I mean, heavenly father, one third of his children right, <laughs> didn't choose to be yeah, with him. Was right. that because he wasn't a good enough father? No. Yeah. And I like how you said that particularly we, you know, sometimes the culture of the church, we can get confused by that. Um, like how you said, you know, um, our happiness can't ultimately be based on, um, you know, if everything falls into place, picture perfect, uh, because sometimes it might not, despite all of our efforts and our, and our, you know, best that we've done over the years. And, you know, I, I truly believe Heavenly Father knows that he knows our hearts and he knows what we've done and what we've tried. And, and he knows how we're feeling when those things don't work out how we thought they would. Yep. It says that he experiences fullness of joy, exaltation, the type of life that God lives is a fullness of joy. He manages to have fullness of joy even mm -hmm. when he's sad at the choices that his children have made and are making now. Very true. Let's move on to the next section here. He talks about the purpose of the church, where he's talking about the blessings that God has given. He starts out with, God's given you a church that strengthens families for mortality and binds them together for eternity. When I read that, I thought of President Packer's oft-repeated quote, um, where he, I mean, every single conference thought, he, he saw, he seemed to bring this up, where he said, the end of all activity in the church is to see that a man and a woman with their children are happy at home, sealed together for time and all eternity. I think sometimes when we talk about programs and we talk about organizations, we get bogged down and lose sight of the end goal of everything. It's people and their relationships um, not not just with each other, most importantly, you know, their relationship with our Heavenly Father and our Savior first, and then their, and then their relationship with each other here on this earth. Absolutely. Uh, and I think programs, you know, really good intentions. There's wonderful things our programs do, but uh, absolutely, it's it's about people and connecting them with, you know, the covenant path and, and the Savior as well. That's what it really comes down to. So a good reminder for all of us. <laughs> Hey, you, you just brought up a point I hadn't thought of before. When he says the church is all about eternal families, the church connects you in eternal families. Well, that sounds all oh, well as a single person. I don't have a place in that. Well, your heavenly father and you, that's an eternal family. Absolutely. And the church is helping us to strengthen that. And, you know, for so many who, who don't have, uh, you know, lots of family members in this life or does, you know, don't have some of those relationships that they have hoped for. Um, that is a true source of, it can be a true source of comfort, kind of like a lifeline to hold on to that no matter what, um, they have a heavenly father, uh, and a heavenly mother who, who loves them and who will always love them and, and knows them better than they know themselves, you know, and is always rooting for them no matter what. And I think that's a huge source of just hope for a lot of people who may be struggling with, you know, um, feeling isolated or, or not, not having a place. 
And this may be a tangent from Miller Holland's talk. How does that perspective, and really, you know, beyond just our faith, but religious perspective, because you counsel with people of other faiths mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. how often does faith weave in to mm-hmm. the mental health concerns and addressing those? Well, it, it, I mean, ethically, it really depends on the person. Um, if that is something that they're wanting to weave into, um, you know, what we're working on, then absolutely. Um, My question is more, how often do they naturally want to do that? I'd say very often. I, I, you know, there are some times when people don't want to talk about that element, um, at all. And that's always something that, you know, you, you have to respect naturally. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously that I think Heavenly Father at that moment wants you to respect, you know, too. But I, I would say a lot of times it, uh, having that spiritual element is a great source of just hope and comfort and really builds that foundation for people, um, where they oftentimes fall back into. Um, and that's where you can kind of reach the core of, you know, their feelings and their desires and their values of what they really want out of this whole experience here on earth. So yeah, it's, it's a great piece to, um, to treatment for sure. Wonderful. Um, the next section, do you, do you have anything else that caught right before we move on to the next section? Uh, I, I think one of the things that he talks about, um, that you had mentioned was, I'm just going to quote this, but he says the leaders of this church are giving their lives to seeking the Lord's guidance in the resolution of these challenges. I really like that because for me, it stands out. Sometimes I do hear, um, that many feel like the leaders of our church are out of touch just because of their age or, or, uh, their, uh, you know, um, Backgrounds or upbringings and um, all these guys with business degrees. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, let, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, mostly men, maybe mostly white males, you know, just, just being honest about that. Um, but I, I think it's helpful for, for a comment like that to, for us to just kind of ponder that these, these people are, um, you know, giving up their whole lives, their whole focus is on doing the Lord's will. And following the spirit. And it's just a good reminder for all of us that, uh, if that, you know, they are doing that, that is, you know, the Lord's going to bless them in doing that and helping them to figure out ways that they can inspire and, and help comfort and bring people back to the covenant path. It's very easy to look at the church's social positions, right? And the number one attack that we get is, oh, it's uncaring. Right. Mm-hmm. And, oh, you guys are just sticking to truth. You haven't really thought about it. If you'd really think about it, you'd agree with me. When I read his quote, and I'll, I'll, read it, I'll read it again, the leaders of this church are giving their lives to seeking the Lord's guidance. You know, I don't think that mm-hmm. the apostles are given much to hyperbole. Mm-hmm. And so it sounds dramatic, and it is. And I remembered Elder Holland's uh, address to BYU uh, last year in the summer in 2021. He specifically addressed, you know, uh, same-sex <laughs> marriage, and he addressed that notion. He mm-hmm. said, we, talking about the, the members of the Quorum 12, are not deaf or blind to the feelings that swirl around marriage and the whole same-sex topic. I and many of my brethren have spent more time and shed more tears on this subject than we could ever adequately convey to you this morning or any morning. We have spent hours discussing what the doctrine of the church can and cannot provide the individuals and families struggling over this difficult issue. You know, people had various reactions to Ellen Hall's address. But everyone, and I've seen from people who just, you know, really hated what he said Mm -hmm. to people who really loved at that moment when he's talking tearfully Mm -hmm. about just the amount of effort he and the other brethren in the Quorum of the Twelve have poured into this. It just completely belies the whole notion that they're out of touch, that, you know, it's just this uncaring thing that that's arbitrarily decided. And that at least is a comfort to me to know because we don't really get to see behind the scenes how much work goes into each of these policy decisions mm-hmm. and each of these discussions that, that everyone's having on the Twitterverse. I, I think that one thing that they have said is they don't have all the answers at this point. I, I think that at some point, you know, after all of this, the Lord's going to put all the pieces to the puzzle of this and help answer those questions. But kind everything of go- will make sense. everything will make sense. But going back to your point, I, that, that specific address and that specific, uh, you know, quote that you were just mentioning, I think at least it can help those in that situation to understand that, that they're not forgotten, that they, that the leaders of the church are mindful of them. They may not understand everything, you know, every single feeling or emotion of how difficult that may be, but, but they're trying to, um, with the Lord's help. Yeah. The, the leaders of the church are very clearly saying, look, we may not be able to give you what you want, but you are being heard and we are wrestling with this every single day. 
and we, we value you. I think that's most important because, um, they're, they're Heavenly Father's children and, um, they're loved and cherished just as much as anyone yeah. else is. So. Yeah. And, and, uh, at the time that we're recording a few days ago, Elder Bednar spoke to the national press, oh. um, club conference, NPC, whatever the C stands for. <laughs> yeah. And they, they were asking him a lot of hard hitting questions and he pointed out, he said, look, we strive to love everyone. And the emphasis is on the word strive. We're not very perfect at doing that as individuals sometime. And he says, anyone of any belief of any tradition, they're welcome inside our chapels, no matter what. And sometimes maybe we as Latter-day Saints, you know, obviously we have our doctrine and, and we do not compromise on our doctrine ever. But sometimes we maybe use that as a club to hit people mm. and make them feel like you're not even welcome to come to church. And that is absolutely not what we want to convey. And has never been what the Lord has wanted us to convey yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Good point. And then he continues on talking about, and, and this is where Elder Holland, his address in the April 2022 sounds a little bit like his October 2021 address. where again, talking about these challenges and, and, you know, I get the sense he's talking a lot about the social issues. He said, you know, we're giving their lives, seeking the Lord's guidance in the resolution of these challenges. If some are not resolved to the satisfaction of everyone, perhaps they constitute part of the cross Jesus said we would have to take up in order to follow him. And of course, link back to October 2021, where he was talking about taking up the cross and the rich young ruler um, and Elder Holland, you know, uh, shared a bunch of stuff from Matthew and from the from the scriptures about how the cost of discipleship is so high. And he said this quote, which I linked, brothers and sisters, I pray we will succeed where that rich young man failed, that we will take up the cross of Christ, however demanding it may be, and regardless of the issue and regardless of that cost. And that sounds really, really tough. Now, one of the things that, and we don't really get into to politics on this, on this podcast, um, but one of the things that was eye-opening for me was, you know, as the church has taken a stance on vaccines, on mask mandates, we saw this big division in the church. And you and I, being uh, in the Word Council yeah. together, we had to deal with some of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the points that I tried to make to people on my side of the aisle is to say, look, for us, maybe a lot of the time we don't have as much of a conflict between what we believe politically and what we believe in the gospel. And now for the first time in our lifetimes that we can remember, there's a conflict and it's relatively minor. And we're freaking out about it. And we need to at least, you know, you can have the debates, we can have discussions, and there's room for all of that. But this is an opportunity for people on my side of the aisle to look with empathy to people on the other and say, wow, if I'm having a hard time squaring, you know, what I think politically with what the church is teaching religiously on this issue, how must it be for someone on the other side where there's a lot other different points where it's just a lot harder to bring those two sometimes into concordance. And so I think that empathy and compassion and discussion is really just the balm of where we're at right now. Absolutely. To fix so much. Absolutely. I think we need to respect others' crosses that they're carrying. Um, I think we can be as empathetic as we can be and communicate that to them and where appropriate, you know, just show them that, that we're willing just to hear. Uh, even if we disagree, but just we're willing to hear and respect that. Um, so I, I, you know, just my own two senses, I think Heavenly Father wants us to learn how to respect other people's crosses, uh, and, and to support them, even if, uh, we may think differently or feel differently or, or what have you. Uh, you know, I think in anything like our prophets and general authorities teach us that at any struggle, any opposition or trial, um, they often tell us to ask us, ask ourselves, what can we learn from this? And so if we look back with COVID and, and even just the intricacies of all of that and divisions, we can ask ourselves, what is he trying to teach us? What are we supposed to learn from this? And I think it is to have that empathy and to work on, you know, not judging others, um, and, um, you know, trying to be more like the savior. And I think that part of that is being a lot more transparent about the struggles we're going through, right? How often is it that I, I hear and I've, I've seen it circumstances where you have this family that appears very active, they have it all together, and then all of a sudden next week they're gone and there's been this horrible divorce or something and there's something that you've always looked up and there's brewing under the surface and no one wants to talk about their problems or even where they are spiritually. You have people who are you know, in the high council or in stake leadership or something, and then they'll lose their testimony because mm -hmm. they weren't honest and forthcoming about doubts and concerns that could have been resolved. Um, I'm thinking of um, 
one person particularly, you know, he's very forthcoming and honest about mm-hmm. his doubts with me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, why? Let's have that discussion in elders <laughs> quorum. Like, cause there's tons of people who are feeling the exact same way. It's just, there's this sense of judgment and I don't know, condemnation. Like, so if I get up and one of the things that I don't have a very strong testimony of personally is fasting. Mm. I know that seems obscure. It seems a weird thing, but I haven't personally seen how going without food and drink contributes to a, you know, a better change in such a tithing very easy. I can see the money going to helping people (laughs) fast off fasting itself. I have a little bit harder time and it's okay for me to talk about that. Sure. And if I say I I'm struggling in my testimony of fasting or my testimony of fasting isn't very strong right now, but I continue to live it. No one's going to judge me. And that's okay. Now, if I say, Oh, I'm struggling with my testimony of the law of chastity, mm. right? All of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, are you apostate? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that that's interesting that you kind of bring that up um, because it made me have, have the thought that um, this is exactly why this talk is so powerful is because he's being so transparent um, about real issues, raw issues, maybe those things that we don't want to necessarily talk about in our fifth Sundays or, you know, in, in up at the pulpit or, or what have you. Uh, and that's the other reason why I like, you know, his previous talk, we talked about, you know, like a broken vessel. It's, it's very transparent. It's very real. Um, and I think when we talk about those things, um, it helps people to normalize, okay, I'm not the only one who's struggling here. Um, because when people start to think that they're the only one, or they feel like they don't have any support or, or maybe they don't have any other options because they're, they're the only ones feeling this way. Or that they're less worthy. For yes. Wondering. Yeah. That's when the greater issues and the greater problems start to compound on each other. Um, and I'm just speaking from a mental health perspective because he does talk about, you know, um, depression and suicide in this talk as we move on. But, but that's when, when we feel like we are isolated and we're alone in whatever it is, struggle, um, that, that, that seems to fuel the fire. Um, well, that's where more. Satan loves to creep in. Absolutely. You are alone. You're the only one who's experienced this. No one can relate to you. Yeah. Yeah. He loves to kick us while we're down. Yep. And so he says, you know, if you're struggling with this stuff, please stay for the whole feast, even if you're not sure about the broccoli. Boy, there are some <laughs> broccoli things about the gospel. Fasting for me is yeah. my broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he just starts the whole talk, right? With that, with the little note by the the child who says, hey, this is boring. You know, I, I, I love that because it, it represents how the Savior comes to us where we are and starts where we are. Um, and you know, will work with us. Um, but sometimes that's where we are, you know, we're, we're not in, in tune or we're not enjoying whatever, wherever we are with church. And, and he, he meets us where we are. Um, so I, I love that example in the beginning. <laughs> I like to say that when God says we're supposed to align our will with his, that means we have to have a will and it's okay to express the will to God and say, here's where I'm at, Lord. Like, yeah. this is what I think. This is how I feel about this. And now that I've got that off my chest and I'm letting you as full transparency, this is where I'm at. Let's talk about where I should be. Yeah. And if we don't, if you don't start with that conversation and you just pretend that you're already over here, you're not actually spinning your, you're just spinning your wheels. Yeah. Now he moves off and he states his authority in this talk. And I, I've learned every time an apostle states his authority, mm-hmm. pay attention. So he says, I close with this special apostolic declaration and then in a lot more words than this, he basically says, please, please don't commit suicide is, mm. is kind of where he, he goes at that. Um, the piece that jumped out to me at first was where he said, it will not relieve the pain you are feeling. Now, my mind immediately jumped to uh, Robin Williams, right? You remember when he uh, tragically took his life, people were posting messages saying, you're free, genie, right? And I think of the song, um, Starry, Starry Night or Vincent or whatever it's called by, uh, was it... Um, I can't remember the singer, Starry, Starry Night, that one. Anyways, he had these lines in there that I remember jumped out to me in junior high when I first studied the song as part Mm -hmm. of an assignment in school, where he said, they could not love you. The world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. You took your life as lovers often do. Perhaps they'll listen now. And I get this impression that so often in society, suicide is almost framed as a heroic act or it's glorified. You contrast that to the gospel mm-hmm. message. Mm-hmm. When Elder Holland said, it will not relieve the pain you are feeling, that flies in the face of what you may mm-hmm. hear from other world sources. Mm-hmm. It's never addressing the premise that it actually fixes anything. Mm. 
and Elder Holland does, which falls right in line with scripture. I linked a few scriptures, Alma 34, where he says the same spirit will have power to possess your body in the eternal world. Mormon 9, where uh, Mormon talks about he who is happy, happy shall be happy still. He that is unhappy shall be unhappy still. Elder Holland just nips that in the bud and said, no, even, even the one thing you may be hoping for, that's not actually going to happen. Nothing actually is fixed or helped, even for the person who thinks that it's an escape. You know, the person who may be contemplating, you know, committing suicide, um, again, they're at that point where they feel like they have no other options. And part of that is because, you know, they're not actively using all the parts of their brain, you know, and, and so they can't, they can't see that there are options. Um, but I think it's important for us to also remember that we have to be careful as well in, in judging, um, if someone has committed suicide in, in judging oh, yes. where they've, you know, what brought them to that point and, and how they followed through with that and so forth. Um, I truly think that that's something that is between them and Heavenly Father. Um, and as, you know, and definitely not saying that Elder Holland, um, does not have a point because he does, obviously. Um, so on one hand, we have to be so careful with, um, how we understand that person and, and why they made the choice that they made. But at the same time, I think he's saying, um, as well, we need you. <laughs> Someone needs you and there is always help. Let us help you. Um, let us have someone kind of help you part these clouds that are just completely clouding your vision and your perspective. Um, and, and I think that's important to instill more of that hope that everyone is needed. Um, and that everyone has a purpose in, in this life. Um, even though they may have times when they, that's completely clouded because of, you know, depression or, or whatever they may be experiencing that can be clouded. Um, I think that's what he's trying to say is, is, we want to, we want to share that message with you. We want you to know that that's still the message that there's still hope and that you have a purpose. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for softening that for me. He, <laughs> yeah. Ho- hopefully I didn't come through wrong. He's not saying it won't relieve the pain you're feeling stupid. He's, <laughs> no, he's, I don't think that's what you're saying. He's definitely saying it. He's teaching my, impl- my understanding was what he was saying is for those who are at the level where you're starting to consider it intellectually. Yeah. Understand that from a doctrinal standpoint, it doesn't even solve the immediate problem that you hope that you're solving. Yeah. So do not even start down that road, despite how so- how society honestly really does glorify mm. it. Yeah, um, I I, th- I think instead he's he's saying you know he at some point he talks about uh, I you know in this talk somewhere um, or maybe it was in his like a broken vessel um, talk but he talked about is before even getting to that point um, getting help so yes. that you can recognize what are the stressors what are the triggers that would lead you to that point um, and I think that's you know preventatively I think that's what is most important um, and I think he also calls out like leaders um, to pay attention look for signs um, and and do what we can to reach out and to love others and to help them feel a sense of safety and connection um, so that they, they won't get to that point, but to kind of be on guard and watch and be observant um, to those that are, that are around us that we may be serving with or serving or, or what have you in the church. We're only at the time of this recording, we're only a few days out from the tragic of all day school shooting and the details are still coming out. But from what we can tell, there were so many signs that no one acted mm-hmm. on that this individual was just in torment. Yeah. So many, you know, so many of these horrific experiences that we've had in our society with, with, um, these school shootings. If you look back on the individuals that have committed these crimes, um, ultimately, if you peel back the layers there, and I'm not saying it's an excuse for their, their actions. It's just horrible what has been done, but there's just another component there too, where they themselves have felt isolated and rejected. Um, again, not an excuse. They chose to do those things, but, uh, it's, we don't know how much, agency how much agency. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, but, but you're right. It, it comes down to feelings of safety and connection. And when those are missing, it, um, it does things to people. And then he finally pleads, and again, he does this as an apostle using stating his authority. 
don't deny us the chance to have you, I plead, in the sacred and holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is someone asking mm-hmm. us in the name of the Lord. Yeah. That's powerful stuff. Now, I read this and one of my initial, I guess, maybe more cynical reactions is, well, here's the conference talk that doesn't apply to me because I am nowhere near being mm-hmm. in this boat. But then I thought about some verses from the Book of Mormon. Second Nephi 2, 27 through 29 This is Lehi talking about how men are free and men are free to choose liberty and eternal life or to choose captivity and death. And then he wraps up with this wonderful quote to Laman and Lemuel. Well, I mean, to all sons, but it was focused at Laman and Lemuel. We know (laughs) he said, I would like you to look to the great meteor of all men, hark to his candles and choose life and not choose eternal death or Jacob six, six, where Lehi's grandson says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts for why will ye die? And then Helaman 7, where uh, the prophet Nephi is just lamenting the state of the Nephites. He says, how is it that you've given yourself away to the enticing of the guy who's trying to throw you away into hell? Repent ye, repent ye, why will ye die? Those verses came into my mind when I thought, well, maybe this talk isn't super applicable to me because it's just asking people not to commit suicide. And I realized that in a spiritual level, that is all prophets and apostles are ever asking us to do, ever. They're asking us to avoid spiritual death. Hmm. And every choice that we make, maybe it doesn't lead us to a, a physical commission of suicide, but every choice that we make leads us towards one path spiritually or the other, towards spiritual life or spiritual death. So that that suddenly hit home for me and I realized, oh, this talk is more applicable to me than I'd like to admit. Absolutely. Uh, one thought I had as you were you were saying that is, is that you know, there's going to be times and seasons where maybe something, something specific like this doesn't apply to us. Um, but at the same time, I think also, I think there's a huge message in this talk that is telling us that we need to get outside of ourselves. If we're not in that season, we need to get outside of ourselves and be more observant to those around us who may be, uh, displaying some of these signs or symptoms. And, uh, we know that, um, that's, part of one of the main reasons why we're here is to not only, you know, love Heavenly Father and the Savior, but to love our neighbors. And so I think if, if, you know, we hear instruction like this that may not be um, applicable to us at this time, at some point it will, because we may come across someone, um, where that may happen, or it may come across us as, you know, at, at some point. But I think it's a matter of look around, be observant and minister to others. So I guess you can add when the Savior says, you know, when you see someone poor and help them, when you saw someone sick and mm-hmm. visit, or in prison, visit him, someone sick and visited with them. You can add when you saw someone manifesting self-harm or any of these danger signs of red flags that clearly needed more help than human physicians can give. And you don't reach out and get them the help they need that you've done it to me as well. Absolutely. One of the things I think of when we are, when I hear the word ministering from a mental health perspective is, is helping someone to feel a sense of safety and connection. When someone has that, there are biological consequences, positive biological consequences that come from feeling safe and connected. And part of our ministering from that perspective is to help someone to feel that sense of safety and connections. It, it may be the only time that they feel that way, but it can do you know, just wonders for them and, and helping them to have hope and to keep trying and to, um, you know, keep living each day. So that's something that, um, you know, through this talk, I think if, if it doesn't apply to us specifically, um, I, I think we need to be observant of others and, um, and provide that ministering as best as we can. That's awesome. Yeah. One of the things I've been telling the people in the elders quorum, is the big difference I'm noticing between home teaching and ministering is home teaching seems to be about numbers and preaching. Ministering seems to be all about relationships. Yeah. And again, that's, that's what can we take from, take with us when we leave our time on this earth? I mean, the scriptures tell us we really can't take many things. We can take our testimony, you know, our covenants and, and our relationships. Our relationships. Yeah. Awesome. You have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, this, that this is a wonderful talk. I think, um, you know, Elder Holland, he, he, he has this way again of just being transparent and talking about those topics that maybe we tend to shy away from, but are the very topics that we need to be talking more about and helping those who may be struggling. So, um, yeah, this is just, this is gem 
And um, yeah, I just appreciate being invited to be on here and have a discussion. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk Podcast, where we discussed Elder Holland's address, Fear Not, Believe Only. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. You can find links to all of our platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org. Also at conferencetalk.org, you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, find related talks, or learn more about your hosts. Big thanks again to Melissa DiPiola for hopping on mics with me today. If you want to follow her, I've included links to her socials and her professional practice in the show notes. A special note for this episode, if you or a loved one you know is having suicidal thoughts or manifesting the signs that we've discussed earlier, please contact the Suicide Prevention Hotline and speak with a trusted representative. And remember that the thoughts and opinions we share on this podcast represent our own personal values and judgments, not the official positions of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. See you next week.